Welcome to Peter and Ruffy's Football Show here on STV. The main talking points on tonight's programme. Celtic are on the verge of a £30 million windfall if they can overcome halfway of Beersheva in the return leg of their Champions League playoff. They're leading 5-2 from the first leg. Uh, elsewhere, Scotland's sports facility at Harriet Watt University is all set for a grand opening on the 29th of August. That'll be a major boost to our sporting stars not only in football but across many other sports we'll be discussing that and of course the captain's armband which returns to Darren Fletcher at international level for Scotland uh, that's just a few of the topics we'll be discussing Alan Ruff is here with me and I'm delighted to see former St Mirren player and now coach Jamie Fullerton is here uh, to give us a little insight into what he's up to at the moment. Uh, delighted to have you with us, Jamie. Um, of course, all roads lead to the game out in Israel, Ruffy, and Celtic 5-2 in front. Brendan Rodgers knows he's within touching distance mm -hmm. of the draw on Friday. Yeah, it's a healthy one, you know, obviously on paper, but as far as the Israelis say, they'll be, they'll be looking for an early goal and, and a if they were to get an early goal, they, they would think they've got a chance. I mean, they've scored a few goals at home. But it's up to be Celtic to be professional enough to go along there and, and guard what they have. And you would like to think scoring five goals at home, they'd at least be one goal in Celtic away from home. And I think it would just be the way he sets his team out. It'll be interesting. We've saw it on numerous occasions. He's, he's got a, a, an A plan, a B plan. It'll be interesting to see what his plan is tonight and which players actually come onto the park. Yeah, and I don't think there'll be any complacent approach uh, from the players. Scott Brown has already mentioned you never know what can happen in football, but it would need a monumental collapse, Jamie, for Celtic not to get through to the group stages. No, I think the, the way the game's set up, will suit Celtic and Brendan Rodgers, I think with the pace and power that they possess in the team and hitting on the counter with the, the, the Israelis having to come out and, and get a goal, or three, shall we say, I think it's set up for Celtic to go and score more than one. Yeah, uh, and just as Jamie picked up there, it's, it's about just exploiting that space because there's no doubt about mm. it, uh, Beersheba will have to have a go at some point, Ruffy. Yeah, they will. Uh, you know, obviously, with Sinclair wide on one side and could be Forrest on the other, or, or it might be Roberts on one side and Forrest on the other, and Sinclair playing off Griffiths. You know, he's got so many options uh, now, and uh, Jamie was saying there, it's the pace, it's the pace that hurt them the last time, and if they're going to be coming forward, obviously there's going to be gaps, maybe not early on in the game, but certainly later, maybe 20, 25 minutes to go, and he's got people he could throw on that could uh, hurt them. Yeah, and of course, when you consider the money that's on offer down south, Jamie, this is a massive windfall if Celtic can get their hands on it. It doesn't bridge the gap, doesn't even scratch the surface of what the uh, Barclays Premier League is offering, but it certainly helps them recruit players that they might not have been able to had they not been in the Champions League. Yeah, I think that's the key factor you've mentioned there, Peter. I think the fact that it can entice players for Brendan Rodgers from a football point of view... He's looking at the kudos and the status of playing in the Champions League and that's what's driving him and the team forward, no doubt. Yeah, the one downside to this whole thing, Ruffy, and again, uh, you know, I tread very carefully here on this, um, is the fact that the Celtic uh, club itself will find itself in trouble. There's a, there's a fine, uh, possibly some part of the stand being closed. That's a possibility mm -hmm. as well, with, of course, the banners. The, the Israeli police have warned the Celtic fans not to put up Palestine flags. Um, at UEFA themselves, um, again, it's against the rules to show any kind of illicit banner. Um, but uh, on the flip side of this, the Celtic fans have raised over £100,000 for Palestine charities. Now, uh, again, the argument here or the debate is not on the legitimacy of the campaign or what side you feel um, you know, deserves your backing or your sympathies. It, it, it is about Celtic being held accountable for breaking rules. It's nothing to mm -hmm. do with the merits of what the Celtic fans are doing. It's about breaking the rules that's getting Celtic into uh, you know, hot water here. And it's a succession of uh, fines that have been mm -hmm. coming their way for Celtic fans crossing the line. Yeah, and unfortunately for, for the club, uh, the warnings are there. You know, they're there before they actually happen. But unfortunately, some of the supporters aren't taking heed. Uh, and unfortunately, it's the club that's getting punished, not, not the supporters. And, and let's... Let's be correct about this. It's the fifty-five thousand at that game. You know, they weren't all flying flags, and they're the ones that are going to suffer as well. Because if they start shutting down corners of the the stadium, they'll be the ones that will be punished. And and that's what's wrong about the whole thing. I think we all think there's a place 
where to protest, and it's certainly, as we've been told, not in a football ground. Yeah, I, I don't know the Israeli police personally, Ruffy, but I would suggest to you that Israel is not the place <laughs> in a stadium to hold up a Palestine flag in yeah. all seriousness because uh, I don't think they will look upon it with the same kind of uh, standoff attitude that maybe the Glasgow police had. Well, again, it's been put out there, the zero tolerance. You know, how... how how more can you uh, put it down there to people that has zero tolerance, which means don't do it. And if you do do it, then you, this time I think it's the, the individual that's going to be punished rather than the club. OK. Uh, it's Celtic against Hapoel Beersheva and uh, not too far away from kick-off on that one. Um, we're going to switch our attention, uh, a positive note, I think, and something that you know will link into you, Jamie, in the next part of the programme. But there's a, a sports facility that's been built on time, on budget, which is great news, uh, at Harry Watt University. It's the Scotland uh, Sporting Centre. And I think uh, not only football, but a number of sports are going to benefit from it. And I think facilities is the key, and this is another bonus for Scotland. Yeah, very much so, Peter. I think you've, you've nailed it. Facilities enable you to play whatever sport it is. You know, we talk about improving grassroots football with the coaching, but if you've got nowhere to do the coaching, then it's irrelevant how good the coach is. So I think this is a great step forward. And also, Hearts and Hibs are going to benefit from a professional game for the facility, and it's something to look forward to. Yeah, Ruffy, if they'd have had that in your day, you, you, you're... Stop uh, playing. Well, I was just about to say... <laughs> <laughs> not only that, but <laughs> most, of the guy, most of your guys would have been world beaters and they were already top drawn players at that time. Yeah, that's, well, that's <laughs> the thing you have to get your head round of. You know, you're right, Jamie's right in what you're saying. You, you want, it doesn't matter how good, uh, how, how good you are, you want magnificent facilities. You know, but ability will always come through. I mean, I don't think Sunnis and Dalglishan the likes had the, that kind of facility, but they had the ability to come through. But you have to have it in this modern day. I think we've been away behind everybody else. I think that's us, got Tory Glenn and, and the Edinburgh one. It should be Dundee, it should be Aberdeen. We should have them all in place, but it's a start. you know. And I think now uh, the powers that be have realised that it's a necessity now for, for the youth coming through. Yeah, well, not only the medicine, the sports science, the facilities as well. I mean, so many other sports will uh, indeed benefit from this. Uh, I always remember Tommy Burns saying to me about Lennox Town, he says, you know, bricks and mortar won't make the player, but it helps attract people and it helps that you've got the facilities to work with them it, it, it is still all about coaching you know this better than most Jamie because you've got you know a coaching academy out in Spain do you do you see where Tommy was coming from yeah very much I think the coach provides the environment and it's the environment that develops the player but it does make it easier if you've got the correct facilities especially with our weather mm -hmm. at the moment as it is and it impacts and affects I think that's where the Mediterranean countries benefit from the climate and it enables them to coach. You know, I was fortunate enough to watch the Fife Academy last week on a Friday night and the wind was sideways along with the rain. So it's very tough to get certain points and aspects across when you're trying to develop and evolve players. So I think better the facilities with the climate we have and, and the more accessible for the general public, the better. I always thought as well, and you guys might agree with this, might not, I always thought that despite the fact that everybody talks about the things that are more available now to kids to, to try and take them away from the sports that we'd love them to play, um, there was a greater pool of people who were you know, mm -hmm. unconsciously working at their skills out in front of the, uh, you know, the front garden, yeah. roughly. There was a greater pool well, that you could then take a greater percentage of them and work with it. You yeah, know, now numbers, maybe with more yeah. facilities, we'll get a chance to bring more and more kids back into it. Well, they're certainly not going to chase them away, you know, if they think they're coming into a wonderful uh, place to train, you know, and uh, you bring your pals along with you, they'll see where you're going. You're right, you know, it might be the chance that this people young kids will start coming back again and ditching their computers and, and coming in and, and taking part in sport. I think society's changed and that's what you're fighting against. You know, we're in that microwave society where we want instant success. You know, I've got a seven and five year old and they suggest them going out in the garden and practice for two hours of keepy ups, which we all did when we were younger. Mm. They look at you as if you're from another planet yeah. because as you say, the wide range of, of opportunity that they have to access other things means you're fighting another battle too. 
Yeah, it's a great catchphrase that you've used there, Jamie. The microwave society. Where would we be without microwaves? Ruffy <laughs> and myself, thinner. Um, but other than that, <laughs> we'll come back in the next part of the programme. Uh, we're going to talk Scotland's under-21s. Mark Ahara from Dundee has been selected uh, in the team. We'll discuss that squad um, and we will also talk about some of the players that could be on the move in Scotland and some that could be coming back to Scotland as well. All in the company of of our boot room guest, Jamie Fullerton, we'll find out a wee bit more of what his ambitions are for the foreseeable future. Welcome back to Peter and Ruffy's Football Show. Alan Ruff is alongside me, Peter Martin. Our boot room guest is Jamie Fullerton. Uh, incidentally, the draw for the Champions League is made on Friday and uh, well, we'll find out. We'll discuss it in detail. Celtic's match against Hapoel Beersheba on tomorrow night's programme. Hugh Keevans will be joining us on the programme to discuss uh, that game. Uh, Scotland's under-21 squad was announced today, Ruffy. Um, and I'm looking at the team there, Jason Cummings in there. Uh, one of the names that I mentioned uh, prior to it was, uh, of course, uh, Liam Henderson's in there, Lewis McLeod. Um, Mark O'Hara from Dundee was the, mm -hmm. the name that I mentioned. Pff, Kelly must be kicking themselves. I just can't yeah. work it out. I mean, he's suddenly a guy who wanted to play midfield. Suddenly at Dundee, he's transformed, scoring goals, playing really well. Yeah, this is not the first time that a player's been at a club and for whatever reason, uh, the manager, the formation, who knows, but certainly this season he's been absolutely fantastic, particularly against Rangers, he was up and down the park, he was a, he was always a menace for them and again at the weekend there, fantastic, obviously scoring a goal as well, so it's good to see a player like that sometimes when it isn't working out at one club and I think Josh McGuinness came into that, remember we used to discuss it wasn't happening for him at Aberdeen, it never happened for him at St Mirren and now all of a sudden they find a club that it was happening for him, so good luck to the lad. Yeah, um, of course you, you, you would have, you scout a lot and do a lot of, take in a lot of games Jamie down south, um, but what's the general feeling down there to, to, to the Scottish talent that we have and what we, uh, the players that we hope will come through? Yeah, I think if you look at the players that have moved from Scotland to England over the recent years, the, the mentality of English clubs is to take them as young as possible and put them into their system and develop them from there. Uh, Falk have been great at it from a financial point of view and, and generating income from the sale of young talent, having established that Falkirk. So I think if you look at that uh, uh, as a model of, of English clubs' mentality towards the Scottish game where they look to get them as teenagers into their system to then develop them. Yeah, you, you took in the uh, uh, St Mirren and the Hibs game. Jason Cummings is in this uh, team. What did you make of him? Yeah, I think he scored two and could have scored four. You know, first half he was very, very good. Uh, second half he came off the boil a little bit, but I think because Hibs were in such control of the game, it, it, it changed the dynamics of the game. Uh, I'm, I'm pleased to see that they've publicly stated that he'll stay in Scotland for this season. I think that's important. I think before young players jump to go to England, because I don't think that's changed, Alan, from when we played. No. You were obviously a little bit before my time, yeah, but, a little but, bit. <laughs> but people, people and young players that break into Scotland, you know, they strive to play in the English Premier League, but the times have changed where when you were bought by an English club, you were bought for their first team, now they're buying for their under-23s and, and almost going into an abyss if you're not an established player. Yeah, um, when you were, uh, I mean, you had a short spell as manager at Notts County, which, you know, when I, when I look back and I read over it, it was a, a horrendous spell for you. Um, did you, uh, I mean, did that sour your um, taste for uh, management again? Do you want to get back into it now? No, I think, you know, I've been fortunate in 11 years, Peter, where I've experienced many roles since coming into coaching, which enabled me to develop a skill set that is adaptable. Uh, it was a great challenge and experience in Notts County, uh, one that I've definitely learnt from and I'm, I'm striving forward for the next opportunity. Yeah, did you, when you were there, did you look to Scotland and, and, and some of the players, did you use that network of people and contacts that you, you had? Yeah, definitely. I, I think when you're at that level, uh, there's an opportunity to borrow, beg and steal uh, players because I do feel there's a talent here. Young Slater, who was at Kilmarnock, which went down to Colchester, was one that was on my radar. Having started at St Mirren and I've seen him as a, uh, a, a key player that could come in and, and do well in the league and I think they'll show once they establish themselves and, and, and get their feet settled 
how well they can do. Yeah, and from your own personal point of view, I think the, the key thing here is that many a chairman is looking at this season, <clears throat> October, November, suddenly start to get a little bit jittery. Would you like to be considered as a manager up here in Scotland? That's something you want to dip, dip your toe in up here? Again, Peter, I'm open to opportunities. I think as long as you've got a genuine chance of being successful and, and thriving forward, I think, you know, you look at everything and anything, and not just manager roles, you know, there's many other roles within the club that due to experience over the last decade that I could turn my hand to and it's anything would be considered. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and we wish you well on that. I mean, that, that's the thing about it. You know, one man has to lose his job for another door to open for someone to come in, Ruffy. Yeah, they certainly do. But I think we've all been in the game long enough to, to know that's how it operates. And I'm sure the managers that are in jobs just now exactly know that is the circumstances as well. If you're, if you're not successful, there's always somebody waiting to take over. Yeah, absolutely. As far as the academy is concerned, what, you know, what influenced you to think, you know, out in Spain, I think I'll set up a coaching academy there. No, it was actually born from the fact that when I retired, uh, as you do uh, at 30, through injury, I went for a six-month holiday just to clear my head and stayed six years. Yeah. <laughs> uh, once I got involved at coaching over there within the Spanish system, I realised that there was a wealth of talent but no opportunity for a lot of expats in particular, but more so the, the Spanish because the big clubs, the system over there is entirely different. And, and opportunity for the players is limited. So therefore, I've seen it as an avenue to create opportunity for young players. It's a great venture. And of course, it's something I can't believe you uh, didn't decide to coach over in Spain because you like going for six months holidays as well, <laughs> Robbie, <don't you? laughs> As soon as he said that there, yeah. I, just, I could yeah. just get this vision in my head of me saying, I think I'm going to go on a six-month holiday. And then, and then your mum and dad saying, don't be lazy, go and get yourself a job. <laughs> it's amazing how things can turn out, though. I'm delighted that it turned out for Jamie. Yeah, I mean, I, I had a wee bit of it in a, when I went to America in Orlando. I, I had a... A summer in charge of coaching and uh, Jamie will tell you if you've got the right kids there who want to improve and really want to try hard it's, it's fantastic because the facilities are second to none and uh, it's <coughs> worthwhile a try. Yeah okay I've got to get your thoughts guys we're talking about players that are on the move and they've got big decisions to make as well Ruffy. Um, Dundee and Hibbs being linked with Tom Hately he had, he's uh, had a couple of years out in Poland free agent mm -hmm. chance to come back and both these teams Paul Hartley and Neil Lennon looking for a right back. Yeah, well, I think Neil Lennon will be looking for cover for the boy Gray. You know, it's always good to have a player with that ability. He was superb with Motherwell. I thought he was actually going to go down to England at one stage, but he, he chose to go to, to Poland. But uh, I think they know the qualities of the boy. I think that's why they're trying to get him. Yeah, and it's strange. In the last few years, uh, Jamie, it's very rare that you see Scottish players actually decide to go out into Europe and try and ply their trade. I mean, and Barry Douglas also went out to Poland as well. I think he's now gone to Turkey. Turkey, Turkey. yeah. Um, so um, there, it, suddenly people are looking, thinking, OK, I'll try it. Stephen Pearson back out to, uh, I oh, think, yeah. India, yeah. Yeah, he's went to India. Yeah, obviously I did it myself as a teenager, uh, you know, and I thought it was a great experience culturally. Opened my eyes up to, to how they played. And, and just how they lived. Yeah. And, and you were at Bastia, did you change your style? Did you need to? No, not at no. all. Because there was something different. Yeah. Funny enough, first training session, Luba Moravchik was the star player, who I didn't know at the time. <laughs> but they just spent a lot of money bringing him in. And it was just a little keep ball. And as you do in traditional style, as the ball breaks, you go in for the tackle. Stretchered off he was out for three weeks. Coach went ballistic. I had no idea. But then, when I seen him play, I realised why he went ballistic because he was, he was, you know, star of the team. So no, I didn't change, and they eventually accepted it after about three months of every day having the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> that is a <laughs> Ruffy, There is a fantastic yeah. tale for you. Yeah. <laughs> a Scotsman goes it, over yeah. and decides to smash my yeah. It's funny you saying that because he, he, I mean, he was. He was unbelievable in French football, which you would have been more yeah. than aware of. By the time he got here, Ruffy, nobody had yeah. heard of him. Well, luckily enough, he got here if he was with him for two or three weeks. <laughs> <laughs> to, be, to be fair, when, uh, and it was five years before he came to Scotland, so he could run then. So yeah. you can imagine how good he was when, when I played with him. And You talk about top players and what they do, and, and it's natural. Every day, 
he practiced corners and free kicks, left and right foot, every day. Yeah. You know, he was an ultimate yeah. professional. Yeah, absolutely. It's funny you saying that. I, when I was working for STV, Ruffy, and asked Canal Plou, the French uh, television company, if they could send me over um, footage of his goals, uh, and they also sent me over a, a, an interview with Zidane saying he was his favourite player in French yeah. football. Um, but when you looked at the goals, he, he, he was hitting them in with the left and the right foot from anywhere, skills uh, that you couldn't believe. And I actually was wondering, is this the right guy that they've yeah. signed from yeah. MSV Duisburg, 300 yeah. grand? But it's an incredible player, Ruffy. Yeah, he certainly was. And I think that <clears throat> uh, there's not many, the, the, the word legend at Celtic isn't used very often, but certainly he wasn't there that long, but they certainly have him up there with the big ones. Yeah, absolutely, and uh, anybody who can trap a ball with his backside deserves 100% respect, that's what I say. Well, listen, I'm delighted that you come in, Jamie. We wish you well. I certainly hope that there's a job for you in Scotland. If there's a chairman out there that's listening, um, there's certainly uh, a man who's got a tremendous amount of experience. Hopefully somebody taps into it. Thanks very much, Paul. Uh, Jamie Fullerton has been uh, in the studio as our bootroom guest. Uh, thanks to Ruffy and Jamie for joining us on the show. Uh, we will discuss Celtic Hapoel Bersheva uh, on tomorrow's programme. Hugh Keevans will be our bootroom guest on that occasion. Uh, and don't forget, you can interact with us and give us your thoughts on all of this at Peter and Ruffy on Twitter and Facebook.com forward slash Peter and Ruffy. Thanks for watching. Good night. <laughs>